an issue with the connection, I'll just mention on the screen here, if anyone is looking for sort of ongoing education about climate change, this is a podcast put out by the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education. Um, Dr. Cece Sorensen, who's at the Abaco site, um, helps coordinate this and can speak to it more at the end if anyone is interested. But this is another way to get climate and health information on your phone to keep current on what's going on. Thanks, Caleb. So Oh, I was just going to jump in. This is a great podcast. We hear from nurses, we hear from doctors uh, about issues that are happening around the world related to climate change and health. We'd love to have individuals who are participating in this workshop even come on the podcast and share their stories. And also, we'd love to hear from you about stories that we should be covering, right? What's important? We want to make this, this relevant to you. So feel free to subscribe. You're also welcome to join our working group. Um, and I can send out a message about that later if you want to get more involved and in really kind of thinking about what the podcasts are going to be about. Thanks, Dr. Dressler. Okay, thank you. So we're going to now move forward into our next topic, which is air pollution. And I'm going to try and move through this fairly quickly because I think what we've been finding here in Grand Bahama is that the discussions we are having are very productive. And so we're going to go through this. And um, if I can get a five minute warning uh, from Dr. Philippe, that would be great. And this is just to cover some of the key information you need to know about what we are breathing and how it's affecting our health. So we're going to talk a little bit about where air pollution comes from, including fossil fuel use, which continues to be a major source of power here in the islands. Um, we're going to talk about the health effects of air pollution on the heart, the lungs, and other organs of the body. And uh, we are also going to spend a little bit of time thinking about how we can keep people safe and what some locally actionable steps would be, including what we're gonna go through in our exercise at the end. So I wanna start with this list of questions, which I think all of us should be asking. And also share, I was very struck flying into the, uh, the airport yesterday here to look down and see, I was giving a talk on air pollution the next day and I could see air pollution from the airplane as I flew in. So this is very much a issue that is ongoing and that is affecting people's health in the Bahamas. So what is air pollution? Why do we have air pollution here? And how is that related to climate change? What does it do to our health? Who's at risk? Who do we need to be looking out for when the air quality is bad? And how can we protect people and develop solutions here in the Bahamas? What we're going to learn, we're gonna talk about some of the problems where the air pollution is coming from, who it's harming, we're also going to talk about some solutions, things ranging from indoor air filters to electrifying transportation. And we'll talk more about those throughout the talk. I want to introduce a couple of key terms, because one thing we've been learning is that we all speak different languages when it comes to climate change, when it comes to the impacts of climate change, and when it comes to our health. And so these are my four terms I want you to get. They range from straightforward to technical. Air pollution. Well, I'm going to go with the simple answer here, because this is how I actually think about it. There's stuff floating around in the air. It gets into our lungs, it gets into our bodies, and it harms our health, partly in our lungs, but also in our brain, our heart, and other parts of the body. Second, want to introduce the idea of dust plumes. We're going to look at some pictures of these, but this is a particular issue in the Caribbean region, including the Bahamas, of dust floating across the Atlantic Ocean from Sahara and Sahel regions in Africa. And finally, our technical term, PM 2.5. This is a science term used by air pollution scientists and epidemiologists to describe the particular types of particles that have been found to cause health problems because they are so small that they can fit between the cells and get into your bloodstream in your lungs. We're going to talk about this through the lens of a patient. We're going to call this patient John. And I think this helps contextualize what this can mean for our health um, in real terms. So John is 41 years old. He's had asthma since he was a kid. He still lives near the power station, which he grew up next to. He works in a repair shop and he travels by motorbike. And as we're going to talk about each of these aspects of his life affects his risk of health problems from air pollution. So air pollution. We're out here in the ocean, we've got wind. It's beautiful here. It's one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. You would think that air pollution would not be so bad here, but it is in fact an issue. And it's something we're gonna talk about. 
This is a more dramatic image from an industrial site, but I think it helps us visualize that yes, particles can get into the air, they can float around, and clearly this is bad for us to breathe. We talked about these definitions already. I think it is worth mentioning in the UN definition at the top of this screen that this is not purely flecks of dust. This is little chemicals that are formed when you burn things. Maybe wood smoke, maybe little bits and pieces that come out of a car engine when you burn gasoline. And also the possibility of things like molds and spores and pollen. Well, those can also affect our breathing and our health. So when we start zooming in on this, what are we actually talking about? Well, we have some pictures of it on the left side of the screen here. These are electron microscope images of what air pollution looks like. And these particles are so small that they are able to fit into your bloodstream. They float around. Your immune system tries to fight them because they don't know what it are and they want to, to get rid of it. And so they can cause inflammation in the body. And the part of the air pollution that is really problematic is this PM 2.5. That's our technical term again. These are tiny, tiny particles, smaller than 2.5 micrometers. And they cause the inflammation and injury. And this is what is measured and modeled by scientists who study air pollution. And so it's a term, if you're worried about this and wanna do something about it, you may wanna become familiar. And why should we care about this? Well, air pollution is very dangerous. There has been increasing attention to this issue over the past 50 to 60 years. And the mortality globally is quite substantial. Something between uh, five and seven million people a year, depending on which study you look at, are dying as a result of air pollution. And it's contributing to roughly a quarter of deaths from heart disease and stroke and neurologic issues. So very big deal. We're losing a lot of pieces of our life and a lot of people from air pollution. What does this mean in the Bahamas? Well, it's still going on. There has been improvement in many parts of the world over time as people have tried to clean up the air. And so on the right-hand side here, you can see the mortality in the United Kingdom over the past uh, 30 years has decreased quite a bit. So there's a lot less air pollution hurting people in the UK. United States had a similar experience starting in the 1960s with the Clean Air Act, in which it was realized that we were having health problems and we needed to act to reduce the amount of pollution in the air to protect our health. Bahamas has also seen a little bit of improvement, but if you look at that graph on the left, mortality rates have plateaued since about 2000, and they're still substantially higher than they are in a number of other countries. And so I think there is work to be done here to keep people safe. At a personal level, air pollution can be really devastating. And I think it's important to share this story. Um, so this is the story of Ella Kisi Debra. Um, she is a child who lived and died in the United Kingdom. She had asthma. She had asthma most likely because she lived next to one of the busiest motorways in the United Kingdom. And so all of the exhaust from the cars, all of the pollution from the cars that gets out into the air and breathe into your lungs, that got into her lungs and she developed asthma. And when we look at this at a population level, we see there's a very tight link between air pollution and children developing asthma. She wound up dying, young. And when they went to do the death certificate, the coroner listed air pollution as the cause of death. And this got worldwide media attention because it was the first time that somebody had been willing to say, yes, the science is so good, our understanding of the physiology is so good that we can firmly attribute this child's death to air pollution. And her mother has become a very eloquent speaker on why we need to be stepping up to address this issue and keep children safe. I now wanna go into a little bit of how we got here. Why are we dealing with this problem? First, we need to talk about fossil fuels. Dr. Hospitalis was mentioning this in the introductory lecture, that the use of fossil fuels is causing climate change. Well, it's also causing air pollution. And when we look at the benefits we would get from reducing fossil fuel use and moving to cleaner energy sources. Well, we get some benefits by preventing climate change. We also get some immediate health benefits by preventing children from dying of asthma, preventing people from having strokes. 
And so I want to emphasize that reducing fossil fuel use in a lot of urban areas in particular is one of the most effective ways to save lives and protect health that we have. So very powerful public health opportunity. Returning to John, he's had asthma since he was a kid. That's probably related a little bit to where he grew up next to a power station. The child in the United Kingdom we just talked about, Ella, she grew up next to a road. So growing up in a place with bad air is bad for your lungs, it's bad for your health. And once you have asthma, you may carry that diagnosis and deal with its consequences for the rest of your life. We also have other sources of air pollution we should talk about. Dust storms are a big one. Dr. Sorensen has done research on this, looking at ICU admissions, and there's pretty good evidence that the dust coming off of the Sahara is probably linked with some health issues that are also seen in the Caribbean, and Dr. Hospitalis can speak to that perhaps later in the session. In addition, wildfires are a big issue. We have a lot of these in the United States now, particularly in the American West, California, the Pacific Coast, and there is a substantial risk to people who have chronic lung disease when the air quality is very bad, all that smoke getting in and irritating the lungs. We're also going to be seeing worsening of these things with climate change. As the Sahara dries out, there will be more dust storms. As we see drying and heating in places that are prone to forest fires, we will see more fires and more smoke. We're also going to see more ozone and more pollen. And if you look at what happens with ozone, there's a lot of chemistry that happens in the atmosphere, which we won't go into, but suffice to say that warmer temperatures can mean more ground level ozone. And it's worth mentioning here, because I think many of us know about the ozone layer from back in the 1980s. Ozone way up high in the atmosphere protects us from radiation. Ozone down at ground level irritates our lungs. And so what we get with climate change is warmer temperatures. Warmer temperatures give us more ground level ozone that irritates our lungs. Pollen is also getting more intense. We've seen this in the United States quite a bit. The ragweed season is a lot longer. It's happening earlier, it's more intense, and that can really set off people's asthma. More CO2 in the atmosphere has been linked with more pollen in plants. Warmer temperatures have been linked with more pollen in plants. So big issues for us to deal with. I now want to return to the topic of dust. This is a particular issue for this region of the world. So because of the prevailing trade winds that cross the Atlantic, there's always been air blowing across the northern part of Africa, across the Atlantic and into the Caribbean. And what is now happening is when it gets very dry in the parts of Africa that are under that wind, the dust can get into the air, it floats across the ocean, and then it lands in the Caribbean. And this can be mapped by satellite, and we're gonna look at some tools that you can use to see if this is happening where you are at the end of the, the talk. So dust is a big issue. If we think about what climate change means in the Sahel and the Sahara, this part of Africa that's shown on the slide, it means probably more drying out, more desert. There's a lot of concerns about agriculture in that region. And if you don't have agriculture and it turns back to desert, then you get dust and that dust will come here. And so we need to be thinking about what that means for health here and how to keep people safe. This is data from Trinidad and, and thank you to Lydia and Kenneth for, for this image uh, shared via Dr. Hospitalis, uh, basically showing an increase in the number of dusty days in Trinidad. I'm not aware of data for the Bahamas yet on this topic, but that would be an interesting thing to look at if somebody from the Met office or with other you know, scientific skills to do this is available. Uh, because what they're seeing in Trinidad is an increase in this issue. Why do we care? I want to stay healthy. I like breathing. So we've talked about the PM 2.5 at the beginning, these little tiny particles that get into your blood and cause inflammation. Well, they go everywhere. And so this is a look at your cardiovascular system, the heart, the blood vessels that serve all the organs in your body. And what you can see, they're diagramming here, is the particles, you breathe them in, they get into your lungs, they enter the bloodstream, and then they cause these cascades of physiology. So if you are somebody in medicine or nursing or other uh, health fields, you'll be very familiar with these biochemistry cascades. We give somebody a medication, it affects a cell, 
and we get a series of events in the body. Well, we get a series of events in the body from air pollution that are bad. Inflammation, injury to blood vessels, and over time, that can lead to an increased risk of heart attacks, an increased risk of stroke. If someone is pregnant, risk to the blood vessels in the baby. So a lot of different health effects. And we see these in organs throughout the body. We need to be paying attention to this issue because not only is this a long-term threat, bad air quality over your lifetime increases your risk, but also because when the air quality is very bad, it can trigger some of these events. So if you are living through a week of really bad dust and bad air quality, I would expect as an ER doctor that I would be treating some additional patients with strokes and heart attacks that week because people's bodies are stressed. This is a big issue for children as well. And I think when we're talking about climate change, it is very important that we think about youth. They will be living throughout the periods on those graphs. Dr. Sorensen shared the case of a woman born in the 1940s, and you could see the change over her lifetime during that heat lecture. Well, think about the change over the lifetime of children today. We could see some really big worsening of air quality. We could also see some improvements. If we take steps to move to electric transportation, to change how we generate power, we could have clean air and actually better air quality in a clean, carbon neutral future. And so there is a hopeful note here that I wanna emphasize. We don't have to go down a pathway where kids are getting asthma and dying of asthma. We can go down a pathway where we clean up our act and we keep people safe and they live long, happy lives. So returning to John, he's had asthma since he was a kid. He's still carrying that diagnosis. He's still living with that issue. And so what we do that affects our children, it affects them for their whole lives. And so there's a lot we can do. Let's talk about who we will help. Here in the Bahamas, I think you have many different populations. And we're going to be interested to hear from all of the participants today about who you are concerned about after this talk and how you want to keep them safe. To talk you through a little bit of the science of what's been seen when this has been studied in various locations around the world, people with lung disease are obviously at very high risk. The lung is the first organ that gets air that is polluted. And so it is, of course, the first organ to suffer injury. But like we talked about, those little particles, the PM2.5, circulate around the body, causing inflammation and injury to every organ system, particularly those with a lot of blood supply. The heart, the brain, if you are pregnant, the uterus is also at risk. And so risk of miscarriage is also a concern. So we need to be thinking about people who have conditions that put them at risk. John is one of those. He has asthma. And so not only was he put at risk by what his childhood looked like with air pollution, he's at risk today. He is at higher risk than a person who doesn't have asthma when a dust storm comes or when there is a smog event on one of the islands. So when we think about this, we also need to think about the social geography of health. Where do you live? Well, that matters a lot. In medical school, I spent a lot of time learning about social determinants of health or social influencers of health. Things like, do you have access to a grocery store? Do you have a safe place to exercise? Well, we also need to be thinking about what's the air that you breathe in your neighborhood. This map on the left is from the United States on the West Coast, and they looked at air quality at a very high level of detail. They drove around with cars and measured air quality along the streets. And they saw some neighborhoods were at much higher risk than others. If you live right near that highway, that motorway, you are facing a lot of health risks that you would not have even a few hundred meters away. Thinking back to Ella, the girl who died of asthma, she lived right next to one of these roads that is dark, dark, dark red in this image. And so we need to be watching out for people in that situation. Those are people particularly at risk. And John, like we talked about, grew up near a power station and he's commuting on a motorbike. So he's breathing all of that air and exhaust on the road every day when he is going to work. We also need to think about people's indoor air quality. So what do we mean by this? We mean the air in the building. We were having a discussion during lunch about flooding and mold and what it did to buildings. Well, that's a big issue. 
and that mold and those spores can get into the air. They can cause inflammation, cause a lot of problems for people who have asthma or some of the other conditions we talked about. We also need to be thinking about our industrial sites, our work sites, places where you go to work and maybe there's stuff in the air, people are doing stone grinding or running engines. Those can affect your health as well. And so these are places where maybe a mask is a good idea. We've learned a lot about N95s for COVID. Well, those are still good masks for protecting you from air pollution as well. And so that is something, there's a power we have learned over the last couple of years that I think we need to use. John works in a repair shop and you'll notice he's wearing a mask. That's a good thing, we'll come back to it. Because we need to talk about how we can protect ourselves. And this is, I think, one of the places, I'm gonna return to this image later when we talk in the small groups. We need to talk about how we keep people safe, how we find solutions at every level. For some of us, that will mean taking steps in our homes, maybe putting in an air filter. For some of us, that might mean advocating for policy asking people, hey, can we be installing solar panels? We've got all this sunlight here. Why are we burning gas? At the individual level, masks and air filters are our technologies and our houses are our refuge. When they've looked at air quality in California during wildfires, simply going inside and shutting the door works for a couple of days when the smoke is really bad to keep you out of the worst air pollution. And if you have nothing else, that is at least a first step you can take. If you can get an air filter, even better. And if you can get a mask, even better. The preventative approach is very important because once people get sick, then they are in the hospital, they're getting treated, bad things can happen as we learned in the case of Ella. Preventative measures work. So here we highlight John wearing an N95 mask. This is something a lot of us have had to do for years now during the COVID pandemic. Gotten very used to it. I wear a mask at work every day and that's just what it is to go to work. And so for people who work in a machine shop or a place with sandblasting or grinding, maybe this is just what you need to be doing. In the United States, we have OSHA. So we have regulations about health and safety. I imagine you have something similar here that require this in some settings, but I think we need to be extending this to anywhere that you could have bad air that you're inhaling. You might as well keep yourself safe. There's also a lot that communities can do. And this is a little bit of an investment, sometimes of money, but sometimes also of time to figure out what your resources are in your community. A lot of communities have been starting to develop resilience hubs. And I think one of our groups identified this earlier today as one of their solutions was a resilience center. Using a public building to provide a public good when it is needed. And so in heat waves, sometimes we will have people come into libraries to cool off. During bad air quality, you could certainly imagine using a public building with air filters as a place that people can stay for a couple of days during clean air. Changing the transportation system can also help. The more that we remove pollution from the roads coming from trucks and cars and motorbikes, the better. And ways to do that include moving to electric transportation and moving to mass transportation. So. If 10 of us want to get to work in 10 cars, maybe if we all ride a bus together, we run one engine instead of 10 engines, less pollution. If it's an electric motor, even better. For John, he was on a motorbike. Well, let's think about what it would be like if he was on a bike. And you know, I think there are some practicalities we will need to talk about in the collaborative session after this. Road safety, is it safe at night? Is there lighting? So implementation requires a safe environment. But when you create that self environment, cycling can be incredibly productive and can save a country a lot of money and a lot of health issues. Denmark has done a very good job, not only of doing this, but of studying it. And so I share a couple of images from Denmark here on their health economics analysis from advocating for cycle transit and spending a fair amount of money on building bike lanes and building bicycle stoplights and making sure there are bike rental options so that their people can get to work by bicycle safely, quickly, and in good health. And so it means the population is getting exercise because they ride the bike. They're saving money on gasoline, petrol, and they have way less air pollution because none of those people riding bikes are reducing or resulting in any uh, exhaust on the roads. And so the roads are cleaner and healthier. People are getting cardiovascular exercise. The result, businesses 
don't have people calling in for work as much, so their workforce is more reliable because people are not sick, and the country is saving huge amounts of money on healthcare costs. So what we can do in the medical community is educate our patients. I'm a doctor. I like to spend some time before I discharge patients from the hospital, from the emergency department where I work, talking with them about how do we prevent the thing that brought you here from happening again. And so if they're coming with an asthma attack in the middle of pollen season, I'm going to spend some time talking about air filters and staying indoors and how to avoid the hazard that is harming their lungs. So I think we in healthcare have an opportunity and a responsibility to make sure our patients know about these things and to advocate for these things being accessible to them, whether that's in their home or in a public setting. This kid is riding his bike in the middle of a polluted road in Indonesia. We're halfway there. He's on the bike, he's wearing the mask, but it looks a little unsafe. There's a lot of big trucks there. And so I think it's important we not only think about individual actions, but also advocate for big picture solutions, policies. If this kid had a bike lane, there might be 10 more kids on that bike lane as well, and you wouldn't need as many trucks and cars. So the um, policies, to touch on policy, there's a number of things that can be done. I would like to just put a couple of these up here and we may have people with more expertise than me on some of these policies in the room. If so, I would like you to share during the session afterwards. First policy I wanna talk about is clean energy. Oil and gas are expensive. They are a limited resource. They have to be imported. And if there is a disaster, which I think everyone here has witnessed, you can interrupt the supply. And so then you are not resilient. You may not have reliable power. So clean energy not only can reduce carbon emissions, fight climate change, it also can reduce air pollution and keep our lungs safe. And some of these things like solar arrays, well, they're going to keep working as long as the sun is out and they were built correctly. And so there can be some resilience that comes from that as well. Investments in transportation, like I was just talking about, can do a lot to keep people safe and to build a culture of health as well. And that might mean electric buses, it might mean electric cars, and it might mean bicycles. And we need to invest in the infrastructure to be able to have those things work. And finally, building standards. We spent a lot of time during our last session here talking about how do you build to deal with hurricanes? Well, we also need to think about how do you build to keep people safe from air quality? And so that might mean having good seals on your windows and doors so when there's a lot of dust in the air outside, it doesn't come inside. It might mean having air filtration systems built in. And it's important we do this because a lot of people spend a lot of time indoors. We can protect ourselves. Houses are meant to be our home, our shelter. Let's make them our shelter from this problem as well. So to summarize, we've talked about some problems. We've talked about some problems, including the ongoing use of fossil fuels, air pollution that's harming people's health, and also the effects of ozone and dust in the Bahamas. And we've talked about some solutions, masks, air filters, simply staying indoors if you don't have access to anything else when the weather is bad, the air quality is bad. And then reducing our use of oil and gas, increasing use of clean energy, switching to electric transportation, investing in solar panels, in wind turbines, in things that we don't need to pay for the power and it doesn't hurt our health. Finally, we all need to be informed about what the air quality is. Some days it's good, some days it's bad. You may not be able to tell with your eyes and ears and nose what the air quality is. And so we need a little bit of help from science. And that's what we're going to touch on in our collaborative exercise. 